Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. In this particular session, we'll have a summary lecture essentially. We'll be talking about some of the things which we have discussed. But we'll see how some of the themes of modernism, some of the rec recursive themes of 20th Century Fiction can be seen and located uh, in some of the texts that we have done so far. So the theme for today's lecture is epiphany. Right? So that's what we're going to talk about in some details. Um, I did mention Epiphany quite um, extensively while looking at Eliot's early poetry, especially if you remember the section from the poem Preludes, uh, where the fallen woman uh, looks up at the ceiling to see how the images of her life flicker across the ceiling. The word flicker being very important because that's obviously a cinematic metaphor that Eliot is using, uh, it's flickering from some kind of a cinema machine, as it were. And the whole idea of looking at something flickering across the ceiling as an example of an epiphany is interesting because if we push it back to Conrad, which uh, we did prior to Eliot, uh, if you look at Heart of Darkness, the epiphany in that particular novella is interesting as well because it's not an epiphany of enlightenment, it's just a reverse of that, it's an epiphany of anti-illumination, an epiphany of darkness. So the knowledge that uh, Marlowe had gained from Heart of Darkness is the knowledge of nothingness uh, and paradoxically that's the only knowledge which makes him privileged. So that's the paradoxical condition that he inhabits and embodies, that the knowledge of nothingness makes him privileged. So when he comes back uh, to the European space and he wants to tell a story to the European listeners, uh, he can't convey it fully and they don't get him fully. Uh, so they remain sort of uninformed insiders uh, of colonialism where he had actually seen and experienced it and seen the horror of it, but he can't convey it back in a way which deserves uh, you know, a complete uh, capture. So in that sense, the epiphany in Heart of Darkness is one of darkness, uh, is one of anti-illumination, is one of nothingness. It's about the annihilation of the human subject and the dying words of Kurtz, the horror, the horror, is a statement of the annihilation. So the finest specimen of Europe, and if you remember the no novel, I mean the entire Europe, one of the making of Kurtz. So Kurtz is a European man, the perfect European man uh, who cracks up uh, in the colonies and he becomes a native, he becomes a tyrant, he becomes just anti-civilization uh, to the extent that you know the Europe, European machinery has to send someone to get rid of him. And that's a very recurrent theme uh, which has been played across uh, many times in popular culture as well. Uh, there are many films which have a similar theme, the best European general uh, goes to the colonial condition and turns native. Uh, he's a perfect assassin, he's a perfect machine, but he turns against the system. So the system has to send someone to either get rid of him or retrieve him. So you can think of, let's say, uh, Dancing with the Wolves, uh, the Kevin Costner film, and more famously, Apocalypse Now, which is loosely based uh, on Heart of Darkness, where Marlon Brando plays the role of Kurtz, and someone, has to send, someone is sent by the uh, machinery to get rid of him. So the epiphany in Heart of Darkness is obviously a very political experience, right? So it is a horror of imperialism that Marlowe gleans from his experience and one he cannot convey back when he comes back to the colonies, uh, to the, to the met metropolis, the center, right? Now, if we move on to Eliot, we find that the epiphany becomes more and more machinic in quality. So it's, it's got words such as flick up. And even before that, if you look at uh, the love song on J. Alfred Prufrock, the entire procrastination in Prufrock is essentially a negotiation with epiphany. Right, so the negotiation with Epiphany is obviously a neural experience. He's a nervous procrastinator, but it's also an existential experience. It's something which affects him existentially. It affects his self-esteem in a social space. Right, so Epiphany in proof of becomes a negotiation with the external space. And if you remember the poem, uh, and I'm hoping you, you do, uh, the entire references to the mermaids uh, in that poem, where he comes, keeps referring to the mermaids who may or may not sing to him. Uh, you know, that again becomes a negotiation with Epiphany, because the mermaids inhabit the dreamscape, uh, where he has his illuminations, the dreamscape where he seeks solace uh, from the procrastinations of the external space. So the, in external space, he suffers from an experience of uh, inadequate embodiment. He cannot embody himself linguistically, he cannot embody himself sartorially, uh, he cannot embody himself uh, in a level of appearance because you remember the lines, uh, the bald spot in the middle of his hair is seen by the ladies uh, and is commented upon, uh, his sleeves are inadequate as well. So all these different markers of embodiment are insufficient in proof rock. 
So the only space in which he can potentially gain any experience or gain any sense of fulfillment is a dreamscape, uh, which happens to be inhabited by mermaids uh, in the case of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. But of course, the mermaids will not sing to him. And that's the rec recursive motive in the poem. And he keeps saying that they will not sing to me. So again, the epiphany in Prufrock is not about enlightenment. It's not about fulfillment, but rather the opposite of that. Uh, it's about anti-fulfillment, it's about anti-enlightenment, it's about the experience and the recognition of horror, the recognition of nothingness, the knowledge of nothingness, which annihilates them. But the paradox of modernism, of modernist literature, is the knowledge of nothingness is what makes you a privileged human subject. So the only seer-like quality available to the modern subject is is possible through a negotiation with nothingness, through a knowledge of nothingness. You come back from an experience, you suffer an experience, and that experience elevates you existentially despite the horror, despite the darkness, right? So that's the whole paradox of modernism. The epiphany in modernism is not about elevation. The epiphany in modernism is about enervation. It's about exhaustion of the subject. And paradoxically, the exhaustion makes you a privileged subject. And we see a more more medical example of that when you do Mrs. Dalloway, uh, which is a text which will start off uh, after this. When the soldier comes back from the war, he's seen the horrors of the war. So he looks around the metropolis, looks at the civilians uh, getting on with their lives in the metropolis, and he feels completely disconnected. He has a cynical gaze, this alienated gaze, because he had seen the horrors of war. So again, the epiphany in Mrs. Dalloway is a medical condition where he has this PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, is informed by trauma. So it actually becomes a darker in Mrs. Dalloway. The epiphany is traumatic epiphany in Mrs. Dalloway. It's not quite so traumatic in Eliot uh, or um, Conrad, but it's definitely existentially deep and dark. And that's something which uh, is a recursive motive in modernism. Now, if we go along with this, and of course, I just mentioned uh, the fallen woman in Preludes, uh, the prostitute presumably, who has this um, you know, recognition of a life as being fragmented and, 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 and horror-filled and something which is completely dark and alienated from any recognition of society. But that moment of epiphany is important because if you remember, I did mention Ori Bergson in my references to the modernist epiphany and the whole idea, the whole Bergsonian idea of clock time and real time. So epiphany of course takes place in real time or psychological time or what Bergson had called dream, right? Whereas clock time is temps or shared time, uh, something which is shared by everyone. Epiphany elevates you to a different temporal order. So in that sense, epiphany is a spatio-temporal experience. It's a neural experience, it's an existential experience and in the case of modernism, it is profoundly political experience as well. Right? So the whole spatial temporality of epiphany is something which we must bear in mind very carefully when looking at the writings of Conrad or Eliot. Now if you come to Joyce, uh, and one story you've done so far is Araby. The entire story of Araby is about the maturation of a human subject. It's about an erotic experience which cannot be conveyed uh, except in religious metaphors. So the entire linguistic landscape in this particular story is very, very confused because the boy is a Catholic boy growing up in Dublin, a very decadent Dublin, uh, which uh, the religion is very repressive there. The, the institutions are repressive. Everything is uh, anti-freedom, anti-fantasy, anti-imagination, anti-eros. In that kind of a landscape, he finds this object of Eros. I'm using Freudian metaphors quite deliberately. The object of Eros is Mangan's sister. If someone is not really named, but it's someone's sister that he desires. So Mangan's sister becomes the object of Eros, the destination of Eros. And you find the entire gaze that he has about Mangan's sister is a profoundly cinematic gaze. So again, Joyce was very, very aware of the cinematic movements of his times. And I did mention, um, if you're interested in modernism's relationship with cinema, you can look up David Trotter's book, Modernism and Cinema, which has entire chapters in Joyce and Eliot and Wolfe, which I find is very, very interesting for anyone interested in that subject or related areas of research. Now, if we take a look at Araby, we find that a gaze in Araby, the boy's gaze in Araby, which is a, a maturing gaze, something which is getting sexually more mature, erotically more mature, imaginatively more mature, that gaze is quite metonymic in quality. It has a cinematic quality of the close-up and the long shot. And it has also the cinematic uh, quality of deceleration. It sort of slows down when it uh, sort of lingers around certain objects. Uh, so the petticoat and bang and sister, uh, the bodice and the railings, the photoplay along her hair, the nape of her hair. So everything becomes very cinematic. Uh, and very objectified in that way. So in that sense, it is an example of visual objectification. Uh, what people like uh, later film theorists would definitely classify that as an example of visual reification, where we, the gaze is objectifying the scene subject. And in that case, in this particular case, the scene subject is female. So the female is essentially objectified by this male uh, erotic imagination, which takes place entirely in, in the story, Arabi. Now, 
if we take a look again, uh, the, the problem with Arabi or the complexity of Arabi, not the problem, the complexity of Arabi is because it lies on the fact that the boy is very, very confused because he has his erotic embodied experiences, but he doesn't want to acknowledge his erotic content, his embodied content. He wants to sublimate it in some kind of a religious uh, or knightly metaphor. And hence all this metaphor is about knight and shining armor, the metaphor of the chalice that he is protecting against the throng of foes. So all these metaphors, all these markers of religious uh, significance become very important in that story because it's trying to sublimate his erotic desire to use or selectively chosen metaphors which are religious and iconic in quality, right? And of course, we see if you read beneath, between the lines, if you take away the religious uh, uh, surface, we find this is actually about a very deep erotic experience that is tr having difficulty to acknowledge uh, as an adolescent boy who is religiously re repressed in a very decadent Dublin. Now, if we take a look at the epiphany in that short story, uh, because, you know, again, at the end of the short story, it's about disillusionment, it's about a massive and colossal disappointment, because the entire idea of Araby uh, had become this exotic space for the boy. And we had seen how the signifiers of desire, the signifiers, the destinations of desire had kept shifting in the story. From Magnan's sister, it has shifted to Araby, uh, the fairy tale, fair ground, as it were, where in different parts of the Orient to the brought in. So again, this is a very white male um, imagination trying to consume this idea of the exotic Orient, right? So the Araby, the very name Araby, which is a sort of uh, a reference to Arabia. So you know, the whole idea of Araby becomes an exotic fair space uh, for the boy, uh, where he can go and get something desirable for his lady love. So again, the nightly narrative is very, very important, and it's very deliberately played out over and over again. Uh, to sublimate his desire. So uh, the attempt on the part of the boy is to tell you this is not about a local story in Dublin about a boy falling in love with a girl. This is something more significant. It's about a knight falling in love with a beloved and hence the religious markers are so important. So it's a deliberate linguistic strategy on the part of the narrator which we have dealt with with some details while we read the story. Now the question of epiphany becomes very important in that story because when he goes to Arabi in the end, he's obviously completely disappointed. And if you find how the disappointment is conveyed to us to very subtle markers, the English accent, for instance, that he gets, that he listens to uh, with one woman flirting with two men, uh, and he notices the English accent, uh, which further alienates him as a Dubliner, as an Irishman. And of course, this is colonial subtext at play over here as well. The, the Dubliner going to this exotic space and feeling alienated and underprivileged because of the English accent around him. And that's something we cannot negotiate with. And there's a couple of words which are very, very important in the context as well. So when the two men flirt with a woman, uh, they keep telling her she had said something and she keeps denying it. And then a word fib is used. Uh, she said as a fib. And the word fib is very, very important because a fib is not really a lie. A fib is a trivial, a flippant lie. So the word, what the word flip does, it prepares you for the negative epiphany in the end. It prepares you for the completely flattening experience in the end, right? It is not really a lie. It's not even a lie. It's a flippant lie. So that's Joyce telling you what's about to happen. It's a completely flattening out of any significance. It's a complete deflation of any dignity that a boy is about to suffer. So the woman says fib, it's not a lie. So Araby in the end turns out to be a fib. It's a very flippant lie. It's not even really a profound lie. It's something related to something similar to the romantic idea of imagination and fantasy. A fantasy being a more degenerated form of imagination. So something similar is happening here as well to the use of the word fib that Joyce is giving us. Right? And the final image of Araby, if you remember, when a boy says, uh, looking up in the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. So again, it's very cinematic, like uh, uh, Eliot's uh, prostitute is looking up at this massively closed fair space, which now becomes, in a sense, a cinema hall, where he sees himself uh, in a magnified version of himself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. So he sees his vanity played out on a big screen in Araby. So Araby, in a way, uh, ends up being a cinema hall for him where he sees himself, his shame spectacularly played out uh, in a darkened space. And he sees himself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burn with anguish and anger. So it has a purgation quality about it. Uh, it's sort of all this vanity is getting burnt away. And with the vanity, what gets burnt away is this entire knightly narrative, the knight in shining armor narrative, which gets burnt away in the end. So again, the epiphany is one of decadence. The epiphany is one of degeneration. It's not really an elevating epiphany. It's something which shames him. It's something which gives him a, a notion of his nothingness. But again, like Eliot's prostitute, like Prufog, this sense of nothingness is what actually matures them paradoxically. So again, we have a recursive marker of Epiphany coming back in Joyce as well. Epiphany does not elevate you. It actually extinguishes you. But this innovation or this sense of being extinguished is actually what makes you a privileged subject. It's actually what makes you a seer. 
right? So you can only see if you get blinded. And we, we talked about this blindness and insight entanglement in Elliot's uh, wasteland as well, especially with the figure of the Tiresias. You can only be only have an insight if you go physically blind. So blindness and insight play out with each other. Uh, and there's a lot of good work done. If you're interested, I'm happy to upload some content about this. Uh, so Tiresias essentially is a camera gaze in wasteland and um, very symbolically he's blind. Uh, so the insight that he has uh, has a price and that price is blindness. So again we have a similar kind of motive played out in Joyce as well. So the epiphany he gets in the end must extinguish him uh, as a romantic erotic subject and that's the whole point uh, of being derided by vanity. So you know I saw a creature, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. I had a full notion, a full spectacle of how vain I was, uh, how filled with vanity I was and that obviously uh, you know ashames them, right? So shames them. So a sense of shame is very important. It's spectacularly played out and that therein lies the epiphany. Like Conrad's Marlowe, like Conrad's Kurtz, the epiphany lies in a horror. It's not really elevating, it's not really existentially uh, transporting to a superior category of existence. It actually brings you down uh, to a more negative state of being, uh, to a more annihilated state of being, which paradoxically makes you a more mature subject of modernity. So I just wanted to uh, summarize the notion of epiphany using some of the texts we have done so far. With that notion in mind, with that understanding in mind, hopefully this has been a fruitful session for you. We'll move on uh, to a more medical understanding of epiphany, which we'll see in Mrs. Jalloway. We have a traumatic victim coming back from the war. In all his epiphanies are filled with trauma, informed by trauma, which he had picked up from the war, and how each epiphany, which makes him a superior subject, comes at a cost of not just his existential innovation, but also his medical and biological innovation. He's essentially a dying man, right? He's essentially a traumatic philic man. So he's someone who's almost fixated to his trauma. He can't move on from the trauma. And that trauma is a price he has to pay for his insight. So Septimus Smith and Mrs. Jalloway has his insight uh, from the war, but the price he has to pay for the insight is essentially not just existential innovation but also biological innovation. It comes to an end at the end. Uh, he kills himself in a novel and that's something which will pay some very close attention to to a very close reading of the text in due course of time. So we move on to Mrs. Jalloway in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.